1964, there was a nuclear explosion in Rhode Island. Yeah, it actually happened, but it didn't look like this. Welcome to Wood River Junction in southern Rhode Island. Today, it's known for the beautiful forests and walking trails, but some of you might be familiar with it for a darker reason. In the woods here was the United Nuclear Corporation Fuels Recovery Plant, constructed in 1963 and abandoned in 1981. What remains of it now is hidden away inside a nature preserve. It looks peaceful now, but back in 1964, this was the site of New England's only nuclear fatality when a criticality accident occurred at the plant. Not sure what that is? Hey, let's learn together. Before the Three Mile Island nuclear meltdown, before Chernobyl, there was the Wood River Junction criticality accident, the location of the U.S. nuclear industry's first and only fatality due to acute radiation poisoning. This is a dark piece of Rhode Island and U.S. history, and while a small nuclear explosion in a quiet town should be more well known, it was kept quiet for decades by the company responsible. So, of course, I wanted to see the location for myself. After a short hike in the woods, I found the abandoned and overgrown road leading to where the United Nuclear Facility used to be. The land I'm walking on is actually in Charlestown, Rhode Island but official documents cite the location as Wood River Junction. That's not the crazy part though. This land wasn't even open to the public until 2016. Yeah, this entire area was fenced off for 52 years because of potential radiation exposure. Mom, I know you're watching and don't worry, it's safe now. Okay, now before I hit you with the details, I have to add a couple disclaimers. First, this is not to be confused with my annual Narragansett nuclear incident where I eat a dozen doughboys, a dozen clam cakes, and a gallon of chowder at Iggy's in one sitting. Second, I am not a scientist or a physicist, but I did read about this for two months straight and awarded myself an internet PhD in nuclear physics, so feel free to believe everything I say, okay? Here's everything you need to know. The facility, constructed in 1963, was actually pretty large. Here's an aerial photo of the plant showing the parking lot, main buildings, wastewater trenches and pools, and remember this one, the emergency building. If you compare this to satellite imagery from today, you can see nothing has changed. Well, except the entire facility is gone. But you can still see the foundations in the area marking where it used to be. Unless you dug into the history here, you would have no idea that this was the site of a nuclear accident. There are no signs, no plaques, not even a gift shop. Let's go back to 1963 now. The plant itself was massively hyped up at the time, and it was supposed to usher in the nuclear age in Rhode Island. There were so many articles published around this time that I was starting to think that United Nuclear owned every newspaper. I thought Beatlemania was a big thing, but no, no, no. It was nuclear that was sweeping the nation. The power of the future. It was in the 60s that nuclear power achieved the status of a technically proven and commercially viable energy source. The science was proven, and let's be honest here, there was money to be made, baby. Normally, when you think of nuclear power, you think giant cooling towers and nuclear reactors. That wasn't the case here. Okay, then what did the plant that used to be here do? It was pretty simple. The facility was designed to recover uranium from scrap material left over from fuel element production. Here's a quick overview of what would happen here. Think of this plant as a nuclear laundromat. Spent fuel rods and other nuclear materials would go through a chemical process over and over until what's left is three things. Waste, the chemical solution, and the enriched uranium, or U-235, which could then be used to create more fuel rods for nuclear power plants. The Wood River Junction facility was up and running for only four months when everything went wrong in here. Let me introduce you to the main subject of this tragic story, Robert Peabody. A resident of Charlestown, Rhode Island, Robert was 37 years old, married with nine children. He worked by day as an auto mechanic and picked up the night shift at the United Nuclear Facility to further support his family. Peabody wasn't an engineer or scientist, he was a technician, so he did basic tasks in the uranium recovery process. I mean, he didn't have an internet PhD like me, but he was no dummy. He followed the rules and logged all of the actions as required, which is why what happened next was so tragic. The day before the criticality, July 23rd, 1964, due to a buildup of waste on equipment in the plant, 
Everything had to be shut down, disassembled, and cleaned. There was a lot to go through, a lot to clean up, and by the end of the day, there was a collection of what's called geometrically safe containers. Some filled with highly concentrated uranium solution, and some filled with very weak solution. These long containers were specifically designed for this though. They ensure that even high concentrations of uranium wouldn't cause an explosion because the atoms were spread far enough apart. But if this uranium solution were to be poured into a smaller area, like a bucket, uranium atoms would all be closer to each other, the material would go critical, producing an uncontrolled atomic reaction called a nuclear excursion, or what I prefer to call it, a huge blast of radiation. The radioactive contents of the cleanup were labeled on each of the containers, but they didn't stick well because of the solvents. Some were re-adhered to the wrong bottles or held on with rubber bands, as you can see in this photo taken at the facility later during the investigation. Some didn't have writing on the labels at all. What I'm saying is, it turned all of these containers here into a radioactive grab bag, something Robert Peabody wasn't aware of since he wasn't at the plant that day. The Day of the Criticality July 24th, 1964. Here's where my internet PhD comes into play. A criticality accident is an accidental, uncontrolled nuclear fission chain reaction. Normally, criticality is a good thing, since that's what happens inside nuclear reactors to create energy. But this facility wasn't a power plant, so criticalities weren't supposed to happen here, especially since they released fatal doses of radiation to any human unlucky enough to be near it unshielded. Remember the uranium-235 reclaiming process from earlier? I said there were three things left over, waste, chemical solution, and uranium. Well, the cleaning fluid itself, trichloroethane, would pick up small amounts of uranium during the process, so then that would need to be washed to squeeze out a bit more U-235. Unfortunately, this trichloroethane was stored in identical bottles to the nuclear grab bag from the day before. Robert Peabody's job on July 24th was to process the dirty trichloroethane in a giant mixer on the third floor of the factory. This is the exact mixer. It's like a giant milkshake machine. He would dump in the contents of the bottle, flip on the mixer, and let the oils, uranium, and cleaning solution all separate. Easy, right? Except Robert hadn't grabbed a container of trichloroethane. In the mix-up from the day before, he actually grabbed a bottle of a very high concentration of enriched uranium. Not knowing the mistake, because the label had fallen off the container, he poured the contents in, condensing the uranium atoms together and causing a nuclear reaction, and a very small explosion. A flash of blue light emanated from the mixing vat, which erupted in hot, glowing liquid that splashed as high as the 12-foot ceiling. The reaction knocked Peabody to the floor, splashing him with radioactive liquid and exposing him to a fatal radiation dose. How much radiation? Robert received 100 grays of exposure and it only takes five to kill you. Robert was hit with the equivalent of 700,000 x-rays at once. Alarm sounded immediately, and Robert ran out of the plant, stripping off his radioactive clothes as he made his way to the facility's emergency building 450 feet away. He was immediately sick and lied down on the floor of the emergency building, already showing signs of extreme radiation poisoning. Dizziness and disorientation, vomiting, and bleeding from the nose and ears. He was taken to Rhode Island Hospital, but with no treatment for radiation sickness available, the only thing they could do was try and keep him comfortable and wait. This is the last photo of Robert, showing his swollen hands, which received the highest dose of radiation. When his family arrived, Robert was awake and told his wife, somebody put a bottle of uranium where it wasn't supposed to be. Go home and take care of the kids, because I'm not going to be able to come home. So how bad was Robert Peabody's exposure? The Worldwide Scientific Review of Criticality Accidents that, yeah, I read for fun, includes every incident in history. Some of these might show higher radiation exposure numbers than Wood River Junction, but that's just for partial body exposure, like an arm or a leg. Peabody, however, received whole body exposure, arguably the worst kind, where no portion of the body is shielded. Every cell in Robert's body was hit with penetrating radiation. More than any other human in history, Radiation levels at the facility were so high that the Geiger counters on site couldn't even measure them. Robert's exact movements after the accident could be traced because he left behind radioactive footprints on the ground. The ambulance he took to the hospital had to be crushed and buried underground because it had absorbed so much radiation. And his wedding ring had to be removed because it had turned into radioactive gold. And one of the saddest parts? 
Every person he came into contact with that night developed health problems commonly linked to radiation exposure. Due to the severity of the case, Robert would die after only 49 hours from multi-organ failure due to extreme radiation exposure, one of only four such deaths in the history of the US and the only one to happen in the private nuclear industry. Robert tragically left behind a wife and nine children, and the incident put Wood River Junction in the history books for all the wrong reasons. Back at the facility, immediately after the incident, the criticality stopped since 20% of the vat's contents had splashed out of the container, making it subcritical. The superintendent ran into the room and switched off the machine, briefly triggering another nuclear criticality as the contents settled to the bottom of the tank. Although he was back out of the room by the time this happened, he was still hit with about one gray of radiation. Not fatal, but not good either. The Atomic Energy Commission eventually found the company in violation of 14 safety regulations, and the plant was shut down for decontamination, but reopened in February of 1965. As a settlement, the Peabody family received only $22,000 from the United Nuclear Corporation. As if that wasn't insulting enough, in order to save face, the company placed the blame squarely on Robert Peabody, saying that he was accident prone and had been involved in several accidents previously, providing no proof or references, then going on to say that he was energetic but does things without thinking things through too well. The company never issued another statement or contacted the Peabody family. The incident was basically swept under the rug and business continued here as usual until 1980, 16 years after Peabody's death. When United Nuclear closed citing declining profits in 1980, leaks of radioactive water into the soil and groundwater had polluted the site of the plant. This put the site under the authority of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The federal government then began a multi-million dollar, decades-long decontamination of the 1,100-acre site. A 1979 aerial survey found radiation exposure rates in the area to be consistent with natural background radiation, except directly over the facility. So it remained empty and closed to the public in the following years. The plant was abandoned here for over a decade until it was demolished in 1994, leaving almost no trace of the history here. Fortunately, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission declared the site safe in October 1995. In 2011, state and federal officials determined no further cleanup action was required. Today, there are currently no nuclear fuels reprocessing plants in New England, and there is still no treatment available for extreme radiation poisoning. It's strange visiting this completely nondescript place in the woods of Rhode Island, knowing what happened here, and the role it played in the history of nuclear energy in America. When you search for nuclear accidents around the world, Wood River Junction appears on the same lists as Chernobyl. Fortunately, the land here has become something beautiful, with public trails now crisscrossing the forests. And that's probably for the best, as nature has a way of forgiving and forgetting some of humanity's worst mistakes, lending something peaceful to Robert Peabody's memory here in Rhode Island. interesting Rhode Island icons like this and learn about their history, you can check out the rest of my Abandoned From Above series on my YouTube channel right now. Thank you very much for watching.